Thank you for joining us for part two of our series, Evaluating Ecosystem Services with Remote Sensing. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'm joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez. And I'm really honored to have with us two guest speakers, Ken Bagstad with the USGS, who will describe the importance of interoperability of data with ARIES, and Becky Chaplin Kramer with Stanford, who will highlight the natural capital project and invest. As a review for this training, we have three sessions, each being one and a half hours long. We had our first session on the 23rd. Today is the 25th, and we'll have the final session on August 30th. We've also listed the course website here where you can find all the materials, including the recording to watch via YouTube, the presentation materials, and eventually the link to the homework assignment. At the end of each session, we will have a question and answer session where we will um, display all of your questions and transcribe the answers on a document. And we will make that document available after the training series is over so you can use it as a reference for the future as well. If you have additional questions that we don't get to, you can email myself or my colleague Juan at our email addresses listed here. And we're so thrilled to have uh, folks from all around the world with us today. And so um, please feel free to introduce yourselves if you'd like, and then also ask your questions along the way, um, and then we'll catalog them for the end of the session. As we mentioned last session, there's one homework assignment um, that will be submitted via Google Form. The homework assignment will be made available on the course website um, by next session, and then you'll have two weeks to complete it by um, Thursday, September 13th. To obtain a certificate of completion, you need to attend all three live webinars and submit the homework assignment by September 13th. If you do this, um, you can look for your certificate of completion about two months after the completion of this course, um, we do have a lot of folks that we send certificates to, so please be patient with us, with us as we catalog those and send them out to everyone. So this is an introductory course, as we mentioned last time. We do recommend having a fundamentals of remote sensing or some kind of equivalent knowledge um, as your prerequisite. So we've listed that here. And then again, we've listed the course website for today um, for any of the materials. For this session, we will start out by outlining the clear linkages between the use of remote sensing for ecosystem assessments and accounting. So last session, we gave you an overview of a lot of the satellites and sensors and data products. But now we're gonna bring those together to show how those um, data and tools can be used within specific questions in context within ecosystem assessment. So we'll, we'll kind of bring it all together there. Um, then we will outline multiple decision support tools that are used for ecosystem assessments and accounting. And then we'll hear from our guest speakers. First, we'll hear from Becky Chaplin Kramer from Stanford who will highlight the Natural Capital Project and the Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs, or the INVEST tool. Then we will hear from Ken Bagstad, who will provide an overview of interoperability and artificial intelligence for environment and sustainability, or the ARIES project. And Ken is joining us from the USGS. So we're so thrilled to have them with us today. As a review from the last session, we discussed that ecosystem services are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems and how the quantification of the value of those ecosystems is really important to economies and society. We also discussed global frameworks for accounting like SIA and the ecosystem accounts. We then provided an overview of remote sensing and how the remote sensing data plays a role in these accounts and provided you with some data and um, products that can be useful within those frameworks. So to start off today's session, 
I'd like to review some of the common questions related to ecosystem assessments and accounting and provide examples of how remote sensing can be used to answer those questions. So this section of today's presentation follows this great paper um, on the uses of remote sensing for natural capital accounting um, from the folks at the Zoological Society of London. And I've provided the reference um, to that paper here in this slide. Um, but it, it, it asks a lot of these questions and provides um, a lot of very specific examples of how to address these questions. So these are things like what habitat, what are the habitat types? and um, how much of each habitat are um, seen in these areas, and then how have habitats changed over time? How much woody biomass is present in the area? What's the canopy structure? What is the state of things like coastal wetlands and mangroves? What are the patterns of annual primary productivity? And how much carbon is stored in the region? And how is that stored carbon changing? Habitat extent, as we discussed in session one, is a major component of establishing a baseline for ecosystems and to identify how they're changing over time. The use of land cover classifications, essentially turning that spectral information we get from satellites into categorical information like land cover classes, is really integral to this work. And it can be obtained via pre-produced maps of land cover or by creating your own map, as we discussed in more detail in the first session. So woody biomass, when we ask ourselves how much woody biomass is present, we're really interested in woody biomass as a key indicator of natural capital stock condition, as it di is directly linked to the amount and type of vegetation, um, i.e. The, the quality of the vegetation present in the habitat. Woody biomass is expressed as the weight of dry matter per unit area. A simple way to derive woody biomass measurements is to use the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, and a simple mathematical equation which transforms the NDVI into the amount of woody biomass present. We also discussed a really fantastic product available, um, newly available product using SAR data to estimate woody biomass in boreal regions. So that is also on the forefront of um, current advances to these estimates and what's being done in those, in those fields. Canopy leaf area, or LAI, as we mentioned last, se last session, can really help us understand canopy structure in an area of interest. It's the measurement of the amount of leaves per present in a given area. It's defined by the area of a single side leaf per unit of ground area in broad leaf canopies, or as the maximum projected green leaf area per unit ground area in coniferous um, canopies. So as, as we mentioned, satellite derived LAI can be used in conjunction with maps of woody biomass and land cover to identify um, areas where LAI has increased or decreased. Um, you also can use things like airborne LIDAR data, which we didn't talk about in much depth last session, um, in these more advanced um, efforts of looking at um, cloud forest, uh, oh, excuse me, um, LIDAR point data can be used to identify forest stands and things like clumping of canopies and leaf area density. And that um, a little bit more advanced in terms of the analysis needed for those types of things, but is really useful for, um, in particular, identifying changes to these systems. Mangroves provide protection against catastrophic events like floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, and they're also really important for improving water quality and act as a sink for nutrients and carbon. So, Oftentimes in regions or countries that have wetlands and mangroves, um, the question of what the state of these ecosystems are is really, really important. We can measure things like extent, change height, biomass, and carbon stock using a combination of optical data like Landsat, as well as 
SAR and LIDAR data. We also have a previous um, RSET training that goes into this in much more depth, um, where we talk about mangrove mapping in support of UN SDGs, and I've provided the, the link for that here. Primary productivity um, is also an important ecosystem service as it measures how productive and healthy the vegetation is. So as we mentioned in the last session, it can be measured using remote sensing, using the NDVI um, on an annual basis. And the integrated NDVI is, is a direct measure of net primary, primary productivity as it's the sum of monthly NDVI um, during the year. Um, and this can be measured via products like Modis, or via sensors like MODIS, and we have freely available products um, for things like NPP um, globally on a yearly basis. Also, knowing the size of carbon pools is critical for understanding the ability of systems to mitigate climate change as the potential emission of carbon produced by their destruction. So remote sensing, again, is a, is a really useful tool to estimate the size of carbon pools in the vegetation of specific areas. And carbon storage is directly linked to above ground biomass and can be estimated using things like NDVI as well as um, data from um, satellites like ISAT-2 and um, DEMs of elevation. So we had also had a previous training on um, monitoring forest cover and change assessments for carbon monitoring with RSET. Um, so you can take a look at that for much more details about carbon storage. Um, this is also an area where there are a lot of advances being made in our ability to um, accurately estimate carbon storage in, in regions. Okay, so now that we've um, reevaluated how remote sensing can be used for some of these really important questions in ecosystem assessments and ecosystem accounting, I also wanted to describe a few decision support tools um, and then um, get into some of those examples. Many of the tools we will mention here are highlighted in a great paper that was uh, led by our guest speaker, Ken Bagstad, today. Um, I've noted the paper here and you can link to that directly and the figure shown here is from that paper as well. In this paper, multiple tools for ecosystem services impact screening, landscape scale modeling and mapping, site scale modeling, and monetary and, mon and non-monetary evaluations are described. And so we'll mention a few of these today. We won't talk about all of them. Um, but we can, we'll talk about a few that highlight um, how they are used at different points within the ecosystem services assessment process. And another point that Ken will highlight later is um, really the need for tools that are quantifiable, repeatable, credible, flexible, and affordable. Um, so having tools at your disposal to conduct this analysis that can be um, applied to different regions or different time periods um, is really, really important, especially as you're cataloging data from many different sources. Costing Nature is a sophisticated web-based spatial policy support system for natural capital accounting and analyzing the ecosystem services produced by natural environments. It can also be used to identify the beneficiaries of these services and assess the impact of human interventions. So it's really a place to develop and implement conservation strategies to see how they might improve ecosystem services. It also allows you to evaluate the intended and unintended consequences of development actions. It incorporates detailed spatial data sets at one square kilometer and one hectare resolution for the entire world. So it includes um, spatial model models for biophysical and socioeconomic processes, along with scenarios for climate and land use. It calculates a baseline for current ecosystem service provision and allows a series of interventions or policy options 
for scenarios of change to be used to understand their impact on the ecosystem service delivery. It really focuses not on valuing nature or how much someone will pay for nature, but rather costing it. So understanding the resource or the land area and the opportunity cost of nature being protected to produce the ecosystem service that we value. EcoServe GIS was um, created in 2012 following work on landscape scale conservation and initiatives and involvement with the UK National Ecosystem Assessment. It focuses on creating maps related to ecosystem service capacity, which is the capacity of an ecosystem or landscape to deliver a service to people, service demand areas, where there is societal demand or need for a service and or the need for ecological regulation, and three, the service benefiting areas, which are graded according to their capacity to deliver a service and the societal and ecological demand for that service. Um, there is also an updated version um, available in R, so EcoServe R, um, and the link to that can be found um, here on the slide uh, for access to it via, via GitHub. So the current toolkit provides the ability to measure and map things like carbon storage, air and water purification, pollination, and many more. Envision is a spatially explicit modeling platform specifically designed for scenario-based exploration of coupled human and natural systems. It's open source and it has been used for a variety of systems. It has the ability to integrate traditional simulation models with multi-agent modeling systems. So this incorporates actors and policies and captures decision rules available to those actors. So the actors make management decisions in parallel with landscape change models using a variety of decision models that can reflect the um, actor values and incorporate the feedback that, change, that policy changes will um, make to the landscape. So it has both of those components there. The Ecosystem Portfolio Model, or EPM, is a prototype that integrates ecological, socioeconomic information, and associated values of relevance to decision makers and stakeholders. So this uses, um, also uses a multi-criteria scenario evaluation framework, and it's um, conducted in a GIS and provides the analysis of spatially explicit land use and land cover change models, to um, characterize changes to the land cover and related ecosystems and relates that to the services and functions. So parameters in the underlying models can be modified through the interface and allows users to facilitate group setting to explore um, the issues of scientific uncertainty and divergence in the preference of stakeholders. One application of this and a really fantastic example that we've linked here um, in the publication is this example from South Florida, where um, the article shows modeled changes, um, which are really significant in the aggregate ecological value. Uh, they also identified landscape patterns and fragmentation, biodiversity potential and ecological restoration potential for current land uses and then future land uses under a um, land use scenario from 2050. Um, so that's a great example of the use of this type of model within um, evaluating ecosystem services. InForest is another that was specifically designed as a web mapping tool to assess ecosystem service calculators in the state of Virginia. Um, so this is very specific to the region, um, but it's, it's another great example that um, where within the web tool, you can identify areas of interest and calculate services um, for things like air quality, carbon sequestration, nutrient and sediment runoff, and open lands. 
Lucy, or the Land Utilization Capability Indicator, is an ecosystem service modeling tool which illustrates the impacts of land use on various ecosystem services. It runs at a fine spatial scale and compares the current services provided by landscape with estimates of their potential capabilities. This uses information to identify where landscape uses change may be beneficial and where maintenance of the status quo might be desirable. So it's relevant for a range of users at multiple scales and within multiple levels of decision making. It can be applied for things like sustainable development, conservation, sustainable tourism, restoration, and policymakers. Um, the, the model incorporates many different types of ecosystem services, including things like agricultural production, carbon sequestration, flood mitigation, and others. Um, it's also an evolving tool, and there are many other tools in development around um, this modeling framework. And to date, it's been used in several countries, including the UK and New Zealand. Um, and it does re require three primary data sets to run um, in the region of interest, which includes a di digital elevation model, land cover information, and soil information. So those are um, sort of those biophysical variables that are needed to incorporate into um, this, this model. ES Values is not a model itself, but it's really a collaborative platform that collects economic data from ecosystem services studies from around the world and then um, applies benefit transfer methods, which we'll talk about briefly in the, in the next slide, um, to produce these value estimates. So the great thing about this portal is that you can discover previous economic valuation studies that are provided for particular ecosystems um, to see if they apply to the work that you're doing. And it allows folks to share their information so that um, it, it can be used for additional um, evaluation um, techniques. So, um, to describe uh, a little bit more of this benefit transfer model, I wanted to also highlight the benefit transfer toolkit. So this is really designed to compile economic value estimates and other information on resources that are not priced in conventional markets. So the benefit transfer model really relies on secondary data and is used to estimate non-market economic values by transferring available information from original studies that are already completed. Um, the source of the available economic information is typically referred to as the study site, and then the area where it's applied um, is referred to as the policy site. So there are two primary approaches, value uh, transfer and function transfer. Um, and you can learn a little bit more about the benefit transfer model um, through um, the link from the USGS here and many other studies. Um, but within this toolkit, there are three primary components. The non-market valu valuation database. Um, so this is similar in some ways to ES values where it has um, value estimates that can be sorted by citation, location, data year, valuation method, um, and you can search and find those um, types of studies that have been done. It also includes a statistical forecasting um, model section, which are interactive forecasting tools that can be um, tailored to economic values for things like estimating the value of hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, and recreation. And then finally, there's a recreation activities map which is a user-friendly map that displays the location of studies included in that um, recreation um, database. Um, so it's a really nice resource here that you can um, go in and check out as well. So now I have the pleasure to hand the um, presentation over to um, Becky Chapman Kramer with Stanford, who will highlight the Natural Capital Project and Invest. So over to you, Becky.
Great, thanks, Amber. I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about the Natural Capital Project and natural capital approaches in general, um, including mapping and modeling of ecosystem services, and give you a brief introduction to INVEST, which is a tool to do just that. So first on the Natural Capital Project, um, our theory of change is that through science, building new scientific approaches for measuring and modeling that the value of nature, and technology um, through you know, advancing the tools and the capacity for people to use them and partnerships, key um, relationships on the ground and at higher levels of government, uh, we can create impact in the world. We can bring better information to decisions that are impacting people and the planet. So the Natural Capital Project is a partnership between many institutions. These are the core partners. Um, uh, with a hub at Stanford University and partners at Stockholm University of Minnesota, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Nature Conservancy, and World Wildlife Fund. And together, this is our mission, pioneering science, technology, and partnerships that enable people and nature to thrive. And just recently, we've spun off another organization called Spring that is meant to scale some of our software approaches outside of an academic environment. Um, and I would love, love, love to talk to you more about this if you have any questions about the, the types of software that Spring could build potentially for your organization. So ecosystem services, um, if you are not familiar with the concept, are the just the benefits of nature to people, um, often called now the contributions, nature's contributions to people. And it's a vast array of ways that people interact with, use, and you know, cherish nature from um, production systems to recreation or cultural values to regulation, regulating services um, like water quality, coastal risk reduction, pollination, um, and, and many, many more. And in general, the reason that we care about quantifying these things is this, this old adage, you can only manage what you can measure. And so while many would say, you know, the values of nature are priceless um, and, and many would agree with them. If we can quantify them in some way, we can we can get them into decisions because it's often difficult to put um, uh, unquantifiable values. Uh, if they're priceless, then they in some some senses they have no they have no price or they have no value to certain decisions. And we're trying to change that. So the way that we think about ecosystem services is in this coupled human and natural system where uh, we think about a value chain uh, moving from biodiversity and ecosystems and the structure and function of those ecosystems um, that provide the supply of an ecosystem service. And then once that intersects with the human parts of the system, the locations and activities of people, that's when it's truly a service. So a lot of ecosystem functions are super important or, or certain places of nature people care about, but by itself, without putting the, the, the human aspect to it, it's just a supply, it's not a service. So once you bring those two together and you have a service, you can then value it if you have information about social preferences. And I really wanna highlight here that when we say values, it's plural. <laughs> And that is not just monetary value. You know, we can think about family values as encompassing a whole range of things um, that often have nothing to do with money. And I would say the same for nature's values. Nature's values are diverse and uh, as complex as people are. And um, I really think that uh, this is changing people's perspectives about we are not monetizing nature. Uh, we are trying to bring a diverse perspective of many people uh, to decisions and understand better how much it matters to people. Uh, the It Best Values Assessment just came out this past summer. I was a coordinating lead author on that. And um, if you're interested, please Google Values Assessment, It Best Intergovernmental pa Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, that really got into that in a lot more detail. So one of these things about how we understand how nature matters to people is the idea of service sheds. So service shed, it comes from the word watershed. Um, where it's, you know, this is all the area that's important to this point. This is where all of this water drains to. But you can take that same analogy and apply it to different services and say, this is all the area that benefits this particular beneficiary, this particular population or this particular point of infrastructure. 
Um, so for watershed, that really is just delineated in basically the, the area upstream from a particular point of interest. But for pollination, it might look really different um, in terms de determined by the flight range of the pollinators and how far they can make it from a farm where uh, pollination services are needed, where there's pollination dependent crops being grown. And then for carbon, the service shed is basically global. Anywhere where carbon is sequestered, um, it's valuable to the whole planet. So what makes ecosystem service assessment complicated is that uh, different services operate at different scales. And so we really need to include all of those different kinds of um, delivery mechanisms of how nature benefits people as we aggregate the values of different services. And so we have to keep that, that cross-scale information in mind. So fundamentally, a natural capital approach uh, is, is based on the idea that changes in ecosystems leads to changes in ecosystem services and their values to people. And so we can get into a little more detail there of thinking about any management or policy decision, like if you take a habitat restoration decision, is gonna have an impact on the land in some way. Um, and so that can change the ecosystem or the ecosystem structure or function um, like if we're, if we're doing habitat repairing restoration, uh, then your stream side habitat might increase an in area or you might be wondering where, where is the most important place to restore. Um, and so that will have an impact on many different ecosystem services. Let's just take the example of water filtration and retention. Where that occurs everywhere is an ecosystem service supply. So that gets back to our value chain of supply service values. Um, so this is just by itself, is just supply everywhere where repairing habitat is holding back maybe sediment or nitrate or nitrate pollution. Um, it is benefiting the stream and that is a supply of ecosystem services. But where we start thinking about it connecting with people, because the sediment load is maybe affecting particularly not just the stream, this says stream, but you know, the a downstream west reservoir that would need to be dredged or an irrigation canal for um for agriculture, um, how it affects the actual uh, use of that water is the ecosystem service. And then we can value that in many different ways. We could think about the avoided treatment cost of that water. We could just think about the number of people affected. Um, that's a little blurry. We might consider that to be more on the service side, but as you move more and more towards people's preferences for that, the number of vulnerable people affected especially, or the health impacts that water quality impacts um, could have on them, uh, we start to get towards the idea of values. So the INVEST tool set is a suite of um, um, a more than 20 ecosystem service models. Um, and ones that aren't even on here are, are included a set of urban ecosystem service models that are, that are still in beta, but um, uh, heat island mitigation and stormwater retention, um, to name a few. So there are an ever-growing list of different services that are represented. And then we have this broader tool set that provide different ways of using those kinds of modeling information in prioritization, in um, development, risk assessment, and in you know, connecting to the sustainable development goals um, and a variety of other contexts. The nice things about INVEST is that they are relatively simple models that are, have, have you know, consequently relatively simple data requirements. Um, they're applicable across the globe, and indeed we've now applied them globally in, in several applications that I'll share a little later. Um, they do have a flexible scale, so if you have more and better information locally, you can do a more careful job of parameterizing than we're able to do at the global scale and get better information out. They take biophysical and economic um, information and, and create biophysical and economic outputs. And by having this, this multi-service framework, it allows multi-service assessment so that you can think about the costs and benefits, the trade-offs um, of different decisions on different ecosystem services. And it's free and open source. Um, so you can go to naturalcapitalproject.stanford.edu and, um, and download it for free right now. The idea of how it works is we are always starting with a land use scenario. Um, so that, as I was saying in that sort of value chain, it starts with a decision, something that is changing on the landscape um, that we wanna assess, and that becomes the scenario. And along with that land use is a large amount of additional data that helps us put in context 
why different land uses matter more in different places. Um, so that could be including topography, like a digital elevation model, precipitation or other climate information, evapotranspiration, climate zones, soil type, all of this different biophysical information. And then we pair that with socioeconomic information like population density, demography, dem demography or other um, information about property values or other like infrastructure or other other aspects of the ways that we might value those services. So then just to take a couple examples, for instance, um, seasonal water yield uh, model would give you um, surface runoff, local recharge and base flow as biophysical uh, outputs. And then the values are, you know, the reduction um, of, of different types of risks, um, the effect on land and groundwater um, for drinking water consumption, uh, water for agriculture, and then the sediment retention model on, on the other side might, you know, that gives us sediment export um, and drinking water quality that can lead to water treatment costs, health related water quality impacts. To take one example of a service, I'll just focus on the sediment retention model. We, we have a lot of materials on our website that I'll share later um, where you could go into depth on any of those models that I showed you earlier, but I'll just give you this one um, for the sake of time as an example for sediment retention. So you have a sense of what really goes into these. These are process-based, we, we call them production function um, style models. And um, they come from the idea of like landscape context matters, where matters. Um, and in this particular case, when we're measuring sediment retention, for every pixel on the landscape, we're evaluating it in terms of what's going on in the upslope area, and what's what's downstream of it basically and that gets us from sediment retention to water purification which would be you know the effect on the beneficiary in this case maybe a reservoir and getting us to value in terms of drinking water and maybe also stream health if that is the value that especially culturally that um, people might care about so on the supply side um, that in at that what i was saying before about every pixel has information about the slope, uh, which is from a digital elevation max, um, the land use that affects the retention capacity, basically, in terms of these parameters called C factor and P factor. And those, so those are attributes assigned to different land uses. The C factor, the, the higher it is, the less retention is going on. So the less soil croplands, for instance, are able to hold on to compared to forest. Um, and these are, you know, an example biophysical table taken from sort of, you know, global averages across many study sites um, that you can look up in the literature, and you can you could clearly tailor that to your own unique uh, site. To, because in some places, maybe forest matters a lot more than than others, um, so it might have a much lower C factor, be much better at, at holding back sediment. Um, and then we also include climate information on precipitation. Erosivity is how. Um, how hard it rains, how fast, and so therefore like how much erosive power it has, as well as soil texture called erodibility, that is um, how sticky the soil is to itself or how, how easily it sloughs off. And so this is a, um, a widely used equation, so the universal soil loss equation, USLE, that just basically takes those erosivity times erodibility times the slope factor times the C factor and the P factor to get us potential soil loss. And then we take that through the landscape. Oh, first I'll just say that it's a very popular method. There's a lot of literature on it. So it is easy to find parameters uh, for different places, but it is a little simplistic. Like I said, these are simple models. It's only for overland erosion. Um, it doesn't get to gully or channel or landslides kinds of erosion. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty in several parameters, the LS factor, especially for high slopes. Um, this model, this general equation was developed within the U.S. Midwest, um, which doesn't have extremely high slopes. So as you move into mountainous areas, um, it can be a little more difficult to parameterize. And then um, the C and P factors, like I said, you can find them in the literature, but, um, but it is, they do vary pretty widely. And they're, they're sort of non-biophysical values. Um, you, you kind of back calculate them. So it's a little, there's, there's a lot of sensitivity to the model in that. And what this gives us is the on-slope 
deposition and therefore the the export you know like some gets deposited on slope and some gets exported to the stream we are not looking at in-stream or floodplain um, deposition anything not in bold is what this this model doesn't cover we're not looking at um, sedimentation processes happening within reservoirs so what's happening on that pixel of interest um, we're thinking about all those factors the slope the climate everything for the source of sediment occurring upslope and that's our transport factor. Um, and then we also look at everything, the, the retention factors and, um, and the slope and soil and everything happening downslope. And that is our, on that downslope path, there's a single path that it takes to the stream, that's our retention. And ultimately that gets us the, the sediment exported to the stream. And so to get at this idea of sediment retention, we're basically taking that potential soil loss, the RKLS, minus the USLE, which also includes the crop and management factors, the CNP factors. And we're multiplying that by a sediment delivery ratio that is based on this upslope transport to downslope retention factor. Um, and, and every pixel then has a retention value. It basically has an amount of sediment that is not making it to the stream. And that is the value. That is, that is the service, the biophysical supply of the service. But that again is just the supply. So we want to think about service. We want to think about value. And valuation in particular is very context specific. There's different ways to value different things depending on what people care about. And there's really very different methods depending on what the value is. So in the case of monetary value, a common um, approach is replacement cost or uh, and or avoided avoided costs. So savings on dredgings or um, uh, the life, calculating the life, how it affects the lifespan of a turbine. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, the big step is getting it from the scenario, say, you know, how does agroforestry affect er erosion reduction in the watershed around a hydropower plant? So in that case, the beneficiary is the hydropower plant, and that's how we get to the actual service value. Whether or not you take it through to the benefit, um, finding that beneficiary and figuring out how it matters to people is what makes it a service. Okay, so that's kind of a, the gory details of one particular model. Um, and again, all the models have their own unique um, inputs and relationships and assumptions. Um, so I encourage you to, to look into this further on the website I'll share later. Um, but also, this is just one tiny part of the whole assessment process. So this is basically where we're analyzing and synthesizing um, the second to last step here. But there's so much before that that goes into scoping and even understanding what the framing is, what, what um, values do stakeholders have and what do they care about and what do they wanna see included in this assessment, compiling the best data sources. And, and there's a lot of like give and take between globally available data like earth observations and local sources that might have more credibility or, or legitimacy. Um, and then a lot goes into the building of the scenarios. I don't want to, um, I, I don't think I can overemphasize how long that sometimes takes and how many iterations. And so that's why we show like, after your first analysis, you all, like you always go back and sometimes it requires a rescope. Sometimes it requires gathering new data. Often it will, you will tweak those scenarios and you'll keep going in a loop between, you know, tweaking scenarios and, and analyzing and synthesizing before you get to that stage of, of communication and impact. So I just want to give you a few examples of that in action. And one is ecosystem service prioritization in watershed management planning. Um, and the Nairobi Water Fund was one example where they really wanted a business case, actually. They wanted, they needed this information to sell their investors on the fact that this made business sense. Like this actually there would be a return on investment um, in X number of years and it would make a big difference. And so in this case, we're using this information um, in a prioritization sense to say, where does it matter to do these different activities? So many different scenarios, agroforestry versus grass strips versus reforestation and put them into an optimization framework to really, you know, so there's not just static scenarios, but um, thinking about how, like how to weigh the costs and benefits and the trade-offs of these different um, activities that could be done. And importantly, what we've found here is that when you do this kind of targeted investment, the return on investment in terms of, for example, like getting this retention, the sediment retention change 
can be two to five times greater than just making a random investment in terms of like getting people to sign up or volunteer. So it's really important to use this kind of information in these sorts of um, investment decisions that can make the difference between whether something is actually has a business case, as we found for, for Nairobi, or if it actually wouldn't um, you know, provide the return on investment that's desired. Another common example is just comparison of different scenarios. And this is a great example of, um, this was a coast, coastal zone management planning in Belize, where um, different uh, stakeholders came together that cared about different aspects of the um, coastal management from fisheries to recreation and tourism in particular, um, in terms of building hotels and in everyone caring about coastal protection from storms. Um, and originally there were, there were two scenarios, a conservation and a development scenario. And this is one of those examples, these great examples of iteration where these two scenarios were tweaked over and over and over to sort of meet somewhere in the middle toward informed management um, that you know was created out of these like many iterations of seeing, well, that that made fisheries go up, but it actually decreased our recreation values and this, this give and take between stakeholders. Um, and ultimately arriving at this informed management plan went into the national coastal zone management plan and actually modeled outcomes of that were several times greater than if they had gone with either of these um, conservation or development scenarios. So that's like a huge success case. Um, another aspect of this is thinking really carefully about the different types of beneficiaries. So um, it's, it's one thing to just think about people in general, um, but a lot of times different populations are really experiencing very different impacts. And if you don't split them out, if you don't think about delineating um, the service sheds for different populations of beneficiaries, you miss a lot of inequities, potential inequities. So an example of this road um, that was being built between um, Peru and Brazil, 250 kilometers um, of road through a through a forest, <laughs> an intact forest, where a lot of indigenous communities were living. Um, the idea was that um, where you know the impact was going to be made, like the, the road was a foregone conclusion, but um, how could it be mitigated? What were the potential activities and, and how much of the service loss could be mitigated? Um, and what we found was actually in certain cases, it can't all be mitigated. And in particular, um, for indigenous people, a lot larger share of the service that is lost and can't be um, that cannot be mitigated no matter what restoration is done was borne by, by those communities. Um, so really thinking carefully about like, how can we communicate the justice of these decisions um, having to do with sustainable long-term sustainability of these communities. Um, and then this uh, is an example with the World Bank um, where they wanted to develop a natural capital index for every country based on this idea of efficiency frontiers. So again, this is the idea of optimization of different, um, different ecosystem services. So in this case, it's comparing production value from um, crop production, timber production, and uh, rangeland livestock production, um, weighing off against a, a set of biodiversity variables and, uh, and greenhouse gas um, uh, avoided emissions of greenhouse gases, um, as well as water quality results that I'm not showing here. But every it's, it's hard to visualize the multidimensional space. So I'm just kind of showing two uh, factors at a time. So you can see that curve. Um, and in every case, this is running, you know, thousands of scenarios, every, you know, possible permutation of, of different landscape configurations to build this, you know, all of these points along this frontier, this curve are technically considered optimal or from the point of view of efficiency, it is producing the most of both biodiversity and production value or, or greenhouse gas em emissions and production value um, on every one of those points. So you can be a little agnostic about, do we want more production value and less biodiversity? The hope is that you're not in this space where the orange points are, where often the, the current points are, um, where you're not even on the frontier. So you, you could move up and be on the efficiency frontier and gain a lot of biodiversity value, or you could move over to the right and be on the frontier and gain a lot of production value without losing any of the other one. 
um, that's called the Pareto efficient solution. So you don't have to give up any production value and you could gain a ton of biodiversity by changing the configuration of your landscape. Um, and so this, like, this idea, this measure of efficiency is something the World Bank wanted to understand, okay, as we do development planning, what could be improved and like how much is there to how much work is there to do and how much of that could be made through investments in green in green growth um, and then finally some of our global work um, uh, thinking about the multiple values like trying to get a broader array of of values of nature um, have been feeding into uh, international policy negotiations like the global biodiversity framework for the convention on Bio biological diversity coming up um, where there's a lot of biodiversity maps going into that. There's been for many years, global maps of species ranges and of, um, and of species richness and of diversity hotspots. And we really haven't had any information at the global scale about ecosystem services. And so in this case, we were doing a prioritization across 12 different types of nature's contributions to people and CP, that's the, that's the CBD language, the it best language. So we try to use it to be consistent. Um, and in this case, we're for all 12 of those, we're, um, we're setting targets to reach a different levels of uh, percent of the total uh, NCP, the total contribution of nature to people. So at 5%, 10%, 20%, all the way up to 100%. How much area do you need to achieve 100%? <laughs> or 15%, you know, all these different targets of all 12 services. So not getting getting rid of, uh, you know, not taking any losses or your unevenness, we're, we're weighting them all equal. Um, and what we found was that you can achieve globally, um, if you do this prioritization within every country, um, you can achieve 90%. You see this this curve start to saturate at 90%, where it takes increasingly more area to get incrementally more value on the y-axis of the of nature's contributions to people. Um, and so, uh, if you think about 90% as being pretty close to current values, you can achieve that. Those, you know, you can maintain current values across all 12 of these different services in 30% of the land and 24% of the oceans. Um, now that varies by country. Some countries require a lot more than 30% to meet their goal, but overall globally, it's just a nice coincidence that that also happens to align with a lot of the targets that are being set um, for 30 by 30, uh, you know, preserving 30% of nature by 2030. And I want to stress that it's so important um, that we don't have an idea of locking this area away into protected areas that people can't access because it's exactly you know being able to access these areas that make them so valuable to so many people in many different ways so thinking about how we can maintain these areas in the state that they're currently in through sustainable use so that's about it and i just want to encourage you um, that you can find our our mooc at um, edx.org if you want to find out more it's a massive open online course um, if you look for the introduction to the natural capital project approach you can also go to our website at naturalcapitalproject.stanford.edu to find out a lot more about these and many more applications of the natural capital approach, as well as more information about all the models. Um, and I also encourage you, if you're interested, please get in touch with us and uh, let us know about your system. We would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. And over to you, Amber. Thank you so much for that presentation, Becky. It was really great to hear about um, INVEST and all of the capabilities and also many of the training resources that you have available for um, future work if folks are interested in um, being involved or utilizing the tools um, and products that you discussed. So thank you so much for that presentation. Now I'd like to hand it over to Ken Bagsad with the USGS, who will discuss interoperability and the artificial intelligence for ecosystem services and natural ca capital accounting, or ARIES project. So over to you, Ken. Thanks so much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. I'm gonna to be speaking on behalf of my co-authors, um, some of whom are mentioned here as well as the UN Statistics Division and UN Environment Program who have supported much of this work. 
So I'm going to be talking today about a tool called Ares. And before I do, I want to spend some time talking about interoperability, which is a really critical point um, in modern data science. And this is quickly defined as the ability of independently developed data and tools to work together with minimal effort. And I would describe this as a core challenge to the global SIA community. There are so many different data streams that need to be integrated and different models as well, um, that to do it properly, we, uh, we need to do a better job at integrating them. And um, I would argue that this, because tools are independently developed and we'd like them to work together with minimal effort, uh, we should add that uh, we wanna be able to use them in computational pipelines. So not just data, but also models and workflows should support interoperability as well. Interoperability by design implies that there are common goals and standards, and there are a few different flavors of it. Um, we have syntactic interoperability, which means we're using compatible data formats and communication protocols. We have a higher level of interoperability called semantic interoperability, which means that in an ideal world, a receiving system can understand the data uh, that it's, uh, that's coming in from another system and can reuse it appropriately. And this is a higher level of interoperability. Uh, it's definitely more complex, but it offers more advantages in terms of being able to automate the use and reuse of data and models. And this is what ARIES is built around, achieving this very hard to, um, to get semantic interoperability that many have been working toward for a long time, but hasn't generally been achieved. I would argue that this is important, and the reason I'm spending so much time talking about it at the beginning of, is that um, there are some major equity issues um, around modeling and the use of scientific data, and that's that many times scientists from the global north can do great science. It's often one-off uh, studies. Uh, the diffusion of best practices uh, from the global north to the global south is time-consuming and requires quite a bit of expertise. And so capacity development um, is time consuming and often quite challenging. And there's a huge equity issue at stake um, here. And one of the things that's been in the front of my mind and that of my colleagues is if there are national governments that are looking to get off the ground with compiling natural capital accounts, how do we maximize their chance for success in this, um, in this quickly growing data and modeling landscape? Um, where there are often major equity issues related to, um, to access and expertise. And so before we worry about choosing a specific model, I would say we need to choose a vision for the future of natural capital accounting implementation. At the same time, we need to remember that people are at the core of interoperability. We need solutions that are user-friendly, equitable, and community-endorsed. And on the left side here, I have a blog post that links to an interoperability strategy that we've written along with our partners at the UN. Um, on the right side is a great blog post that came out about the same time, um, almost exactly a year ago, about why people are essential uh, in data interoperability. And I think these are nice parallel readings about the technical and the human side of interoperability. So our interoperability strategy that we've developed um, puts forth a vision that our natural capital accounts ideally ought to be able to be quickly recompiled when new science emerges and when better models become available, we ought to be able to update those, uh, those results. We should be able to update our trends over time. So when a new year um, da of data becomes available, we should be able to update our time series. And we ought to be able to make good international comparisons using both common models and uh, country-specific customizations of those models and data. And the end goal of all of this, of course, should be to get um, the best quality information into the hands of decision makers, the public, and the media as quickly as possible. So we've heard about some other tools like Invest that provide, for instance, a set of models, um, typically one for each ecosystem service, although we've heard examples from Becky about the customization of Invest models. At the same time, we know that there are a wide range of data viewers out there that, that assist in data visualization. There are cloud computing platforms many of you are probably familiar with. 
And there are a few different frameworks for integrating models. And ARIES is distinct from all of these. Um, and I would argue that it's distinct because its goal is to assemble and use the collective knowledge of the scientific community to improve the implementation of natural capital accounting and other types of models as well. But in this case, we'll be talking about um, the implementation of SIA. Um, so the goal is to have artificial intelligence supporting the selection of the best available data and models for a country specific or a regionally specific application. So what does this look like in practice? Um, I'll argue that something we commonly do in the natural capital accounting community and the ecosystem services community is to look at sediment retention. It matters quite a bit for water quality, for things like hydropower generation and um, a variety of other environmental impacts. And there's often a, a model called um, Russell or the revised universal soil loss equation that's commonly used in many uh, modeling applications. What we often do is we spend a lot of time looking for the data and models to parameterize um, the data and the coefficients to parameterize these models. We often take a lot of time assembling and cleaning data. At the end of the day, we put it into a data repository. There are variants on this, of course, as, um, as um, cloud computing platforms uh, emerge into greater use and um, computational notebooks, for example, are used. But at the end of the day, we're often still working in silos. And um, what we envision with ARIES and with ARIES for SIA is that when experts are instead putting their knowledge and their data and models on the web in ways that a computer system can navigate and navigate the reassembly of those, that the user can much more quickly um, get to higher quality results. And given the urgency of scaling up SIA globally, um, I would argue that this is an important tool for us to do this as a community. Um, not being prescriptive about a particular model because we know that uh, all models are wrong and some are useful, um, but being able to pick the best available model for a particular application and the best data for a particular application. So who benefits? Um, I would argue that there are, th by putting data and models on the web and making them highly accessible, that we ideally make these accessible to the compilers of ecosystem accounts, to um, disadvantaged groups that may have uh, struggled to access high quality scientific information in the past, or to small NGOs or local governments. The more we can get this out there and make this easier, and not require a PhD and years of research to get to, um, the better we can uh, get this information uh, incorporated into decision making. I'm gonna give an example of Aries for SIA in, in a few minutes, um, but I'll just mention for those who are interested in uh, getting started on it, here are a few links in order to do so, as well as support information. Um, we're intending to improve, to continue to improve to, uh, the ability for new users to access and use ARIES through training materials, through uh, support for data hosting, and we're working on a QGIS plugin which will make the data ingestion um, more automated and supporting the semantic annotation of data and models. Now, when it comes to national governments using ARIES for SIA, um, I mentioned that we'd like to be able to do this quickly. We'd like to be able to do this well incredibly, of course. And the process that we've envisioned for doing that is ideally a government is deciding what methods do you want to use? Um, which models, which data uh, are the best fit? Um, can we catalog? Can those governments go move on to step two and catalog? which nationally available models and data are best available, which ones can be made public for others to reuse in the future, which ones need to be kept restricted, which ARIES can do, ARIES can choose, uh, can, can note which models can be made public and which ones can be made restricted. If we take the time to make those data and models interoperable and to put them into public or private projects, we can make sure that uh, public information can be widely used um, by any scientific user while privately uh, kept data and models are kept restricted to the appropriate audience. 
the testing and validation models as a fourth step. And finally, to produce accounts using Aries for SIA and to revisit underlying data and methods as new and better approaches become available. So with all of this, the vision that um, we're putting forth is that any country, but in particular the global south, within say a five-year time frame, and if we as a global community put a clear focus on interoperability, we would be able to have any country, and particularly those in the global south, producing their own accounts, endorsed by their own national statistical offices, and populated with their own data, um, to be able to regularly update the accounts as new data become available, to continually improve the quality of the estimates as the science evolves, and to lead south-south capacity building around natural capital accounting. So if the global community is able to coalesce on a shared interoperability platform, I think this is what the future can look like. And I think it's a very exciting future and one that I hope you'll join us in striving to work toward. So with that, I'm going to um, move over from presenting to uh, on a presentation to showing the Aries for SIA Explorer. So this is the Aries for SIA Web Explorer, um, which is accessible to anyone who registers for a free account. Uh, you can actually access this in multiple languages. So currently, I believe five languages with more on the way. I'm showing the English version here. And we see a, a standard map viewer, um, but over here on the left, the option to select a region, a spatial resolution, and um, a temporal um, resolution of interest. So what we can do here is we can select a part of the world we're interested in running models for, and I can either scroll to an area, I can type an area in here, or I can select um, running, for instance, administrative regions. And in this case, I'm going to run this for Nicaragua, which um, we just saw a demo from Becky for um, Costa Rica with some ecosystem service models. I'll give an example of a country where um, that's nearby and perhaps similar in some ways, but, uh, but more lacking in data than Costa Rica. After choosing a region we wanna run the model for and a time period, uh, we simply select a checkbox. And in this case, um, I'll choose to run a model for, for carbon storage. And when I click on this, Aries looks at which models are available and it goes to the web and um, finds the most appropriate model of those, of those available and interoperable for carbon storage. And then it finds the data sets that are needed to populate that model. Again, chooses the most appropriate um, and it's pulling these from the web. You can see we've quickly pulled in a variety of data sets and are starting to um, compute this from the period of 2012 to 2019. Um, one of the things that's nice is the more people contribute models to ARIES, the more flexible it grows. So for instance, the custom models we just saw from Costa Rica, if those are made interoperable um, with ARIES, we'd be able to run them for Costa Rica and perhaps for adjacent countries if that was deemed appropriate by the model developers. Um, we can see that all of these data sets can be uh, viewed um, and they can also be downloaded um, for further analysis. And we actually have the results which popped up here. I'm gonna go back to this data viewer for a moment and we can look at, um, for instance, data on elevation, ecosystem types, and carbon storage. Uh, we can look at the, um, we can look at the histogram, the distribution of the inf of the data. We can um, adjust the transparency of these data, et cetera. And what we can also do is what's produced automatically um, as a result of a model run is first of all a table. Um, so this is the table showing the change in carbon storage from uh, 2012 to 2018 and the net change for each of these ecosystem types using the IUCN ecosystem type classification. We can download this table as an Excel file. Um, and we get um, a report that's automatically produced um, that describes um, the general um, SIA, the system of environmental economic accounting, the models that are used for ecosystem extent, carbon, um, and the methods 
that are used, any results um, in map format as well as tabular format, um, any caveats around the use of these in the form of a discussion and references related to the production of those accounts. Again, we get the tables. We also get um, a series of maps and we can look at the data sets that were used in the production of the models. The third piece we get is a data flow diagram, which describes all the algorithms that were used and the data sets that were used in the production of this particular modeling run. So we can click on a particular data set and we can see which data set was used and uh, a variety of metadata about them. We can click on um, an algorithm or a lookup table and we can see what actual, actually was run during that, um, that modeling workflow. Um, so that is the Aries for CA Explorer. You can see it's a way to quickly produce accounts with um, using a variety of data hosted on the web. And ideally, as more people contribute data and models in an interoperable framework, we'll be able to do more and more powerful assessments and, um, and to contribute to the global uptake of natural capital accounting. Thanks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ken, for that overview and that demonstration of ARIES. It was really great to um, learn more about that project and the efforts that you and your team are working towards. So thank you so much for being with us. So in summary for today, remote sensing can be used to assess a variety of questions related to the valuation of ecosystem services. There are many types of models and methods for assessing the value of ecosystem services. We heard about the natural capital project that aims to improve the well being of people and our planet by motivating targeted investments in nature with a focus on science, technology, and partnership. We also heard about ARIES technology that highlights interoperability to allow models and data to be contributed by independent researchers is hosted on a network and automatically assembles um, data into model workflows. So we are so grateful to have our guest speakers with us today to provide um, those deep dives into these um, tools and resources for this type of work. We are also looking forward to our final session where we're going to be highlighting multiple ecosystem accounting use cases from around the world. We'll also have a guest speaker, Mitty Harris, from Hunter College City University of New York, who will provide information um, on a few projects that his team is working on in relation to ecosystem accounting as well. So we're really looking forward to our final session where we'll bring it on home with many different use case applications and um, uh, from around the world. So we hope that you um, do join us for next session as well. As a reminder, here's the contact information for myself and my colleague Juan Torres Perez. Um, you can also find all of the information about this training on our website listed here. Um, again, we, we have many, many trainings available via RSET in different application areas. You can stay connected with us by following us on Twitter to hear about upcoming trainings. You can also check out our um, sister programs within Capacity Building at NASA, um, Develop and Severe. So I do encourage you to um, take a look at all of those resources and to stay connected with us um, in the future. So thank you so much. Um, we will now move into the question and answer portion of our session today. Great, thank you everyone for being with us today and staying online with us for about 15 minutes of our question and answer session. Um, I just wanna make note that uh, we have folks from all around the world um, over a thousand folks um, online with us today so happy to have you with us um, and we'll go ahead and go through some of the um, questions that you all have posed as we did with the first session um, we'll be walking through some of these questions 
there I'm sure will be more questions we won't be able to get to um, that we'll answer via the document and we'll be posting all of the um, answers to the Q&A here on the website. Um, give us about a week to go through the questions and uh, make sure they look good and then we'll be posting them. So you can use that as a reference later on as well. Um, if your question didn't get answered during the session and you don't find your question on the Q&A document, feel free to email myself or my colleague Juan um, and we'll do our best to um, answer your question via email as well. Um, great, so we'll just jump right in here. Um, we do have um, Ken and Becky online with us as well, so I'll be jumping um, over to you all for some of the, um, the questions directed uh, towards your projects as we as we go as well. So you feel free to jump in at any point um, as well. You, you are both the experts in the, the, this field. So we'll get started. Um, question one, is it possible to estimate the ecosystem services provided by microorganisms with remote sensing? Um, it's a really good question. Um, I know remote sensing has been used to monitor microorganisms, for example, that contribute to harmful algal blooms or HABs, um, like cyanobacteria, um, due to their ability to give off a particular spectral signature on the water. So we have to think about what the satellites are measuring and what they can um, see on the ground. Um, However, I'm not aware of uh, monitoring microorganisms through soil, um, things like that. Um, there are, oh, um, my colleague put this in here, that's a great point. There are some studies that combine um, eDNA data, so environmental DNA, um, on things like uh, fish species uh, and compare that to environmental parameters that can be remotely sensed. So, looking at things like water quality, water temperature. Um, there are, there's a lot of really exciting research coming out of that field right now. Um, so this can link um, to the microorganisms that are present in say those um, water body environments. So we've provided a couple examples of links to papers as well. Okay, qu question two. The question asks, um, generally the land use land cover classification process is study oriented. It makes it difficult to compare studies. Um, you know, a, a great point that um, Ken was mentioning in, in his project, uh, in his presentation as well. So the question is there, is there a classification standard for ecosystem services and how can we treat different ecosystem services needs related to land use and land cover in an integrated study? So it's a good point. Um, we highlighted the benefits of creating your own land cover classification to increase accuracy as um, you would have potentially knowledge of your specific region and ground-based information to help um, assess the accuracy and validate the, those maps. But there are global and regional maps that we mentioned. So we highlighted um, maps generated via MODIS. Um, there are also maps uh, provided by ESA. We have links to those in the first session. Um, and then also, I, I think uh, Ken added a little bit to this question, so I'll pause and see, if Ken, if you'd like to add anything more to this answer. Sorry, I'm getting a ton of background noise. I'm actually having my window repaired right now, and so I'm uh, probably not the best uh, person to answer right now. Okay, no worries. Um, you know, we're not hearing too much of it there, but I'll just read your answer here. I know you um, typed in many of your answers as well. So um, the, the rest of it states that uh, from an interoperability perspective, this is a major and important challenge. Um, and to be able to reuse existing land cover data um, in studies in future, um, in future studies as well. So there's also the um, FAO, who has their land cover classification system um, and their land, land cover uh, meta language. Um, so those are resources that you can use for um, answering this question and solving, helping to solve that problem. Okay, question three. Uh, what are the parameters used in developing the um, costing nature index? And uh, I'll be frank, I just pulled this from the costing nature website. So, 
Um, they have um, 18 ecosystem services that we've listed there. Um, and the, the real point here is to then link those services to things like conservation priority um, and then apply scenarios for land use change or management change efforts related to those types of um, services outlined here. So I won't read through all of them, but they're listed there for your reference as well. Okay, question four. Uh, what mathematical equation is used to transform NDVI into woody biomass? Um, it'd be great to get some of those equations. So um, there are a few different methods that you can use. You can use a simple empirical method where you're actually comparing values of NDVI to uh, ground-based information of above ground biomass. Um, that's the most commonly used approach, but this does require local forest inventory data. Um, and those types of studies have used things like Landsat, although you could also use data um, from um, LIDAR or airborne sensors if you have those kinds of, of data available to you. Um, and I've provided a link to a paper that describes that approach. Um, there are also um, methods for using physically based models, but they're um, much less commonly used um, in that approach and, and takes a um, I would say a, a higher level of effort and um, additional um, data and variables to um, generate those physically based models and to um, best categorize the system. Um, so you can take a look at that um, article for more information there. Um, this question we, we talked a little bit about last session and we'll be talking more next session about this. Um, but the question says, we mentioned um, an article by Townsend, which talks about the challenge of marine ecosystem evaluations. Um, but given processes such as seagrass assessment and PP and other things, um, and available um, information on fish stocks, is there an appropriate tool to combine these resources? Um, so yeah, the, the, there, there are data sets available for um, monitoring these types of um, marine ecosystems. And I also, we can link to our previous training that we just, uh, that my colleague Juan um, just led on um, uh, aquatic vegetation. Um, that might be a great resource for you to um, take a look at when um, trying to better uh, evaluate these types of ecosystems using remote sensing. Um, there's also a few other um, sources of information we've provided, like the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership, um, and they're working on a standardized approach at, me at measuring and valuing ecosystem services in oceans. So taking into account many of the um, variables that you mentioned here as well. Um, and there's also the Marine Geo Portal, which we mentioned last session. Um, and we will also be going in a little bit more depth into that Townsend um, paper in um, the final session. So if you are interested in hearing a bit more about that, um, stay with us for our next session. Okay, question six. Is Lucy only available for the UK and New Zealand? If we have required data sets for an area of interest, can we use that service? Um, it looks like also based on um, the information from their website, it's primarily been used in the UK and New Zealand, but they are exploring applications in other places like Australia, the Philippines, Vietnam, et cetera, um, but they have not expanded beyond that um, currently. Um, so you can take a look at the um, Lucy website for more information. And um, would you all mind scrolling down so we can see question seven? Thank you. Um, so this question mentions that many of the, the examples provided here talk about forest ecosystems, but how can we quantify ecosystem services in arid or semi-arid regions where plants are few with no canopy cover? Um, and that's a great point. Um, many of the similar applications can be applied to um, semi-arid and arid ecosystems. And these types of ecosystems do have many very important um, um, ecosystem services like carbon storage, dust regulation, habitat for important species, um, and many cultural ecosystem services. So 
there are many other variables beyond, um, say, your standard um, use of timber for um, export um, example that you could use for evaluating these types of systems. Okay, so question eight. Um, can you point me in the right direction to find current work related to ethics around valuing the priceless? Uh, it's a really great point. Um, and um, Becky also did mention the, um, the need to include indigenous peoples, their cultural value systems within um, these types of assessments as well. Um, and uh, there, I listed a paper from Nature that, that highlights the, um, the need to um, include indigenous voices in, in that work. Um, and then um, Becky also listed a um, summary for, for policymakers here. Um, and I'll just pause and um, see if Becky, if there was anything else that you wanted to highlight in regards to this question. Yeah, I would just say the, the best values assessment is exactly meant to um, be the ultimate resource for that. It collected um, tens of thousands of, of pieces of evidence and different methods um, for doing this kind of valuing ac across a wide variety of worldviews. Um, and so the summary for policymakers gives you a sense of what is done, and then there will be a lot of uh, more details and really, you know, guides um, through a lot of the ways that you can pick through these different methods families for being able to value nature in different ways. So I would just keep your eye on that. Like the, the summary for policymakers is a great resource already, but there will be a lot more detail you can dig into if you're interested in this. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Becky. Appreciate that. Okay, moving on to question nine here. For water-related ecosystems, which metrics that are easily taken in the field do you recommend? For example, for the valuation of the importance of different types of vegetation um, in the water supply. Um, so we have um, Ken provided a, a little bit of an answer here um, and said that this question is more tailored to the modelers, but we do need more field-based water quality data. Um, and these data could be combined with um, stream flow data as well. Um, and this is a frequent limitation um, that he runs into in assessing um, water quality um, models. Um, I also did mention our previous training on um, uh, aquatic vegetation. That might be another good resource to take a look at in terms of identifying and mapping things like um, kelp, um, which can be a very important um, cultural um, ecosystem service in some regions as well. So um, take a look at the previous training we provided along those lines as well. Thank you. Okay, question 10. What are some tools we can use to assess ecosystem services using QGIS or Google Earth Engine uh, rather than downloading new programs that require ARC? Um, so I, I believe um, Ken popped this answer in here as well. Both of the tools um, Aries and Invest can be run without needing ArcGIS um, using QGIS to prepare, prepare the um, inputs in advance of the analysis. Um, I will also mention that we will be highlighting a project um, from Liberia that is a NASA and Conservation International collaboration where they have developed methodologies using Google Earth Engine to create their ecosystem extent maps. Um, as well as R to um, create their um, generalized um, ecosystem models as well. So stay tuned for more information on that. And we do have a previous RSET training on the use of Earth Engine for um, land applications that includes land cover classification. Um, I'll pause here to see if Becky or Ken want to make any other comments in regards to question 10. Yeah, I just um, I think that it's a really important point that these are invest is not a, a visualization tool yet, although I think it has that we've been had the ambition to be for quite some time. But there are other there are lots of visual free open source visualization tools that you can use to look at the inputs and the outputs. And so really, you don't you don't need any uh, proprietary software. Same with Aries. But um, the one other thing I'll say is that Google Earth Engine is extremely powerful, especially, you know, intent, potentially for acquiring and processing your input data. But we actually can't 
put a lot of ecosystem services on that platform because it doesn't have the way that Google Earth Engine sees uh, data is through pixel stacks, um, not through relationships between pixels. So all of the hydrological routing that Invest in Aries does um, can't actually happen on Google Earth Engine. And so that is kind of a limitation there. I think ultimately what we can see is hopefully a lot of uh, cross-platform integration through APIs um, and other techniques, but but not necessarily sitting on that particular platform. That's a great point, Becky. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. And I believe the next question is um, directed towards you as well. A uh, question eleven asks, "What is the best data format for rasters to use and invest in?" Invest? Yeah, I think maybe I'm not understanding uh, the question, but it's just TIFFs. So if there's, please let me know if it, it's a more complicated question than that. Um, uh, it, there's, you know, NetCDF and other formats are pretty easily converted to TIFFs. Um, so just let me know if there's additional confusion around that point. Great. Thank you, Becky. Um, so we are right at um, uh, 930 Pacific, my time, I'm sure you all are in different locations. We'll go to one more question here, and then I will make note that we have um, some more questions here, and we'll be answering them via text and, again, providing them um, as a resource to all on the website as well. But let's um, do question 12 as the final question here. How do you integrate expected changes brought by climate change into your model? For example, planting trees that will be unfit for climate conditions in three decades will not bring the services or values we expect of them now. Um, and Ken provided a great um, description here that I'll, I'll go ahead and read. And um, he mentioned there are a few ways to approach this problem. First, rather than using land cover data that just indicates forests, that model inputs distinguish between different types of forests, including planted species that may have different impacts on ecosystem services, such as eucalyptus or um, pine plantings um, are known to have different effects on water um, ecosystem services. Second, climate scenarios will drive future ecosystem services, both in terms of future temperature and precipitation, that directly drives services and how that relates to land cover inputs into the model. Um, for example, the ecosystem service might not function under the um, anticipated changes to um, climate. Um, and then there's a lot of uncertainty here because you're addressing factors in the future as opposed to just looking at the um, scenarios of today. And um, Becky, maybe I'll pause if you'd like to um, describe your answer a little bit as well. Sure, yeah, I think this is such an important question and area, active area of research that um, actually we're working with USGS on right now, in fact, um, thinking about how ecosystem services and climate change modeling can be better linked. Um, but it really comes at the scenarios point of the, like if you remember that, that approach, the phases of the approach, um, the models themselves are pretty agnostic and will take any land cover map. Um, it, the models, the ecosystem service models don't generate land cover maps. That's like a pre-modeling pre step. It's a different, different step in the modeling. Um, it, they also, many of the services also take climate inputs. So climate change is reflected both through the drivers as well as through the ecosystems themselves. But in order to map future ecosystems, or I think the question here that's really good is how do you let stakeholders know what the available option set even is if they want to do a restoration act, you know, action somewhere um, to, to be able to understand what long term is possible in that location that, that you know, maybe forest restoration, even though there's forest nearby now, is not going to work because the, the climate is changing around that area and won't support forest anymore. Um, so I think that it we need to work with, you know, this set of ecosystem modelers and um, there's, you know, global models for this, dynamic global vegetation models, there's ecosystem models that are more place-based, site-based. Um, and really, I think one big frontier for ecosystem services modeling is to move beyond just categorical land cover that sees, you know, this is forest and this is grassland as discrete quantities and toward more continuous measures that these ecosystem models could produce, like what you were showing with the remote sensing around NDVI or with biomass models to be able to say, well, you know, different functions are possible with different structure of ecosystems, not just the, not just the land cover type. So if we see a more um, productive forest, it might do a better job of 
holding back sediment or retaining water to mitigate floods or providing resources to pollinators or whatever the case may be. And so this is an area of my research that I'm super excited about. I didn't talk about it today, but I would love to get in touch with anyone that um, is working on, on similar issues. Great, thank you, Becky. It's a, it's a really, really important point. And I think also with the advancement of, of the remote sensing technology in particular, um, more folks using things like SAR data, um, the potential for global um, SAR mapping efforts um, that can more accurately um, estimate things like for structure and the, then the potential benefits to the um, services that different types of these ecosystems provide. So I think that's a really important point and um, right on the forefront of um, sounds like what where the research community is as well as where um, we are in terms of instrument development and um, data um, services. So thank you so much for that. Um, with that, uh, with that really great question, I think we will go ahead and end for today. I um, just want to give a huge thank you to Ken and Becky again for your contributions to the this training. I think it's so fantastic to have the experts with us to to provide the that level of detail and um, for being with us for the Q and A today. So thanks again for um, your time. We really value it. Um, and thanks again to everyone who's attended the training. Um, the last session and today. Um, we have one more session, so do please join us um, on uh, next Tuesday for our third and final session where we'll be providing uh, more examples of um, case studies um, that can highlight some of the variables used in the, the um, methodologies um, for doing this type of accounting. So do please join us next time. Um, also um, look for the link to the homework on the website next time as well. And again, as always, you can find all of the resources, including a recording of today's session and um, all of the sessions on the course website as well. So do please check back there and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.